want to take us this morning back into the Gospel of John, of course, but I want to take us out of the resurrection scene, and I want us to see what resurrection does. And so we know the resurrection story well enough that Jesus rose from the dead. We know the story well enough that Jesus came uh, to defeat death and to defeat the grave and uh, so that you and I might have eternal life. But the rest of the gospel really leads up to that point. And in John chapter 4, we meet a woman whose name we will never know until we get to heaven. And this woman we call the Samaritan woman. And we're going to read the first 26 verses from John chapter 4. And Marius is going to read for us. And as we um, hear the gospel, I invite you to stand. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but the disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sagar near the plot of the ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. The disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flock drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks, of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such 
of thee to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So far the scripture. Each of us has a deep need that we just can't fill. This morning, Linda put some lotion on my back because it was itching and I couldn't reach it. That kind of a thing. And the people that are around us have that same thirst. The person sitting next to you, it may be packaged a little bit different, but we have that same thirst. And the people around us who, who do not acknowledge God have that same thirst, and they're walking around dehydrated spiritually, dying of thirst, and they don't even know it. Drought is a huge problem around the world if you read the history of the Sahara Desert, you know that it used to be one of the most fertile lands that has ever existed on this planet. Today it's a dry desert, stretching for eons of miles and into several countries. Spiritual thirst, God says, is also a reality. Psalm 42 talks about it. As a deer longs for the water, so my Soul longs for God. We talk about thirst, spiritual thirst. Not only in our Western world or in the societies or, or in the Eastern world, but also within the church. Let me give you just a little bit of background on, on the on this sermon. Jesus has heard that the, that the Pharisees have heard that he's baptizing and making more disciples than John is. And we know the kind of reception that John got, and Jesus really doesn't want to get into it with the, with the Pharisees at this point. So he goes back through Samaria to go to home, which is in Galilee. There's two reasons that he goes that way. First of all, it's the shortest way home. I mean, you can go all the way around Samaria. Is that picture of Samaria? No, it's not. That picture of Samaria you'll see in a few minutes. It, we're just, just going around is, is a long way, and it takes you to a place that the Bible calls the place of darkness, Decapolis, it's called, the place of ten cities. So Jesus goes straight through. But also Jesus goes straight through because he has a divine appointment that God set up. And being ever obedient to his father, he stops in a place called Sychar by a well which is known as Jacob's Well. And there should be a picture. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fine. And at Sychar, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, um, there's a small town and the well is on the other side of the road of that town. Joseph's tomb is there. And if you see Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim on, on the left and on the right, those are known as the, the mountains of blessings and cursings from Joshua. Jesus comes up and he sits at the well that is there. And we got some pictures of the well. This is inside the church where the, pic, where the picture was taken. Uh, the church is called, it's an Orthodox called, uh, called St. Fontini, Fontini's. Um, and as you can see, you, you can see the, the well there in the center, uh, right before the baptismal font. And if you take a look down the well, this is what you see. It's approximately 100 feet deep. 
which is important to our story. So when you take a look at this well, and you see what the well is all about, and you see Jesus sort of sitting by that well, a woman comes. And that's interesting. Because in chapter 3, a man comes. Nicodemus comes at night. We know his name. We don't know the woman's name, but she comes in the brilliance of the noontime sun. John's playing with darkness and light again. She is, he is a Jewish man, she is a Samaritan woman. In other words, he's a man of importance because he's a Pharisee, he's religious, he's respected. The woman, on the other hand, is a Samaritan woman where there's no respect anyway because, number one, she's a woman, and number two, she's a woman of ill repute and not considered to be very religious. Two totally opposite people. One was probably much richer than the other, and one came to find out what Jesus came to do, and the other came just to get some water. But they do have something in common. Despite his religiosity, and despite her sinful life, they're both lost. They're spiritually dead. And they're both being chased by the Christ. Remember Nicodemus? Any person who can do what you do must be from God. And Jesus instantaneously changes the subject and says, the problem is not who I am, but the problem is where do you stand with God? You're dead. The woman comes, and she says nothing to the man, and she gets ready to lower the bucket, and Jesus says to her, give me something to drink, and he begins to woo her. He wants to bring her from the temporal, this water, to what he has to offer her. And now you can understand why the woman has a problem with what Jesus says, because Number one, he's a Jewish man, and Jewish men don't talk to Samaritan women, women especially in public. And number two, we read in the Bible that Jews and Gent uh, Samaritans don't drink from the same cup. And that's what he's basically doing. He's asking her, can I drink from your cup? And she's not quite sure. She says, how are you going to give me to drink if you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep, 100 feet deep. And Jesus said, but if you only knew the gift of God, if you only knew the gift of God. I don't know if that made her nervous because I'm sure that lots of men have offered her gifts. And I'm sure that in her line of work or in her line of marriage, there were lots of things that were right and that were wrong about a relationship with a man. And the gifts come and go. They, they stand on, the, on, the, uh, on a small shelf in her house for one day or two days or maybe two years until the next man comes along and then he offers her something and she puts it there. But Jesus wants her to know that the gift he's offering isn't something she has to pay for. It's not a gift that, that is just going to be around for just a little while. It's a gift that would be bought and paid for by a body crucified, pierced with nails and spears, utter darkness of hell. It would be a price that he would pay for her so that she would not have to pay for what he was about to offer her and what he's about to offer us. If you only knew the gift of God. So the qu first question we need to ask ourselves, do we know that gift? 
When life falls down and we, we become dismayed, are we like the Israelites who, who Jeremiah describes in their rebellion against God in chapter 2 when he writes, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked and utterly de desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that do not hold water. And that's sort of what I want to liken that kind of water to. It's not pure. It's not real. It does the job. I'll tell you later whether it helped me focus or not. But it does the job. But it's not real water. It's only there to make us drink more water. To help us think we're more healthy. The Israelites thought that, that God and Baal together would be a much better religion than just God alone. The Samaritans thought that, that the God that they served on Mount Gerizim would be a lot better than the God that was served in Israel, in Jerusalem. The point Jesus is making is that this will not satisfy. The more I drink it, the sooner it will be gone. And the sooner it is gone, I have to run back to the tap and I have to get some more so that I can drink some more later on. But Jesus says, that's not the water I'm offering you. Jesus says, everyone who is thirsty will have to come back and drink and get more and drink it and then come back and drink more. But the water that I'm offering to you, they will never thirst again. It will become within them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And I love that verse in verse 14. Jesus says, I'm giving you something that you do not have inherently on your own. I'm giving you something that you cannot even begin to think that you might want it by yourself. So I think of the world that she lived in. I think of the world that I live in. And I'm thinking they're not that much different. Her world was wrapped around that, that well. She came alone because she was being ostracized by everyone else. Except for that man. Who seemed to be waiting for her. I think of my world in which everything is momentary. And we just settled for that. The biggest, the best, the fastest. But it doesn't satisfy. The woman was willing, I think, to settle for less than what Jesus had to offer. If he would just leave her alone, she could get her water and she could go back to the city. She was happy with just the water that was coming out of the spring at the bottom of the well to make her happy for a moment and to make the man happy with whom she was living. And yet Jesus in Matthew makes it so clear to us that we can't have both. We can't have the worldly water. We can't have godly water. We can't have Jesus and something added to it. It's Jesus or nothing at all. He says, you'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll hate the one and serve the other. He makes it clear we can't do both. A blog that I wrote, uh, I read, sorry, a while back, is that we seek to satisfy our bodies and our spiritual life in God as if it were one motion. Paul says it's an impossibility. He writes in Romans that if I set my mind on the flesh, I have death. If I set my mind on the spirit, I have life. And Jesus is offering her something that, that she cannot have by herself. So basically, I need to take the cup that Jesus offers. You know the words from Isaiah, Ho, everyone that thirsts. Come to the water, you that have no money, come buy and eat. 
buy wine and milk without money, without price? For why do you spend money on water and milk and bread that does not uh, satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. And God himself declares himself to be that rich food. So this is what Jesus offers. First of all, Jesus is waiting at the well. He's waiting for people like us. Some of us have drunk from the well before, and we love the water. But then we turn someone else, somewhere else. Or maybe we've been drinking from it all our lives, and we've forgotten how good it truly is. And Jesus says, I just want you to listen. I want you to come. I want you to have a drink with me, pure water. Someone once wrote that being near the water doesn't help your thirst. Going to church, carrying a Bible around, listening to Christian music is all good and well, but it's not drinking the water. Those who drink are the ones who admit that they're thirsty. And those who are thirsty will want to drink. The person who is thirst is quench is not the one who looks at the water and says, cool, but rather who drinks. Notice what Jesus offers. To the one who comes and drinks will never thirst again. Think about that. Not physically, but spiritually. Think of a life that has no striving, no stress. Think of a life that there's no wanting or wishing. Fully satisfied. Completely satisfied with what God has blessed us with in spiritual gifts. Gifts that are in our homes, in our cars, with our children. A kind of life where you'll never thirst for things that the world has to offer ever again. You know, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. May I just tell you, it's not. I've been there. God who understands our deepest thirst is willing to fill us to the brim with his goodness, his grace, his joy, his mercy, his peace. God is willing to say later on in the gospel that I have come to, to set you free and in that freedom there's so much joy and it's joy to the fullest. It's more joy than you've ever had before. And all that is, is God filling my every need. Too good to be true? Come to the well. He'll tell you himself. Prophet Isaiah promised that in one of my favorite chapters, Isaiah 12, verse 3, with joy you will uh, drink from the well of salvation. Such a great verse. Second thing that Jesus promises that we will be filled to the overflowing. The trouble with Jacob's well is the water is 100 feet away. You need a good strong bucket, a good strong rope. You need a good strong pulley to make it happen. Jacob's well was fresh water, constantly fresh. It was also known as Jacob's spring. Because there's a spring under the water that makes the water to flow and it's constantly in movement so it doesn't just sit there for the mosquitoes to hatch their legs, eggs, but rather it's forever brimming. Jesus says, you want that kind of water, I'll give you that kind of water. You want that kind of a life, I will give you that kind of a life. I will fill you with my spirit to the overflowing so that you, so that you, will show who I truly am to the world and the folks around you. 
you will be filled to the brim. It's sort of like in chapter 3, the wind blows where it wants to. Well, this brook just bubbles up consistently within us. It's what he's offering her. It's what he's offering us. A greater joy, a greater sense of contentment, a deeper thanksgiving life. Thirdly, that this water will not only become in us a spring that is truly overflowing, but it will well up unto eternal life. Jesus is offering us something that, that is endless. It's not something that has to re be replaced Sunday by Sunday. He gives us water that is endless. He gives us a life that is endless. He draw, when we draw from the well, we draw power and strength from him that, so that the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, the strength of the Spirit, however you want to say it, comes and wells within us a life that is from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus knows about her affairs. I lost a friend whose name was Tom. It wasn't that long ago. And my own consolation is that when anybody dies, whether we have the casket here or we stand around a casket or an urn in another place, the only thing that keeps me going at that particular point is that Jesus says, you know what? I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the water of life. You're going to keep going because of who I am and because you know my promise that where I am, you will be also. And so Jesus invites her then to come and, and bring her husband. It's not because Jesus doesn't, doesn't think she's not getting it or that he really ought to be talking to a man. No, this is the woman he needed to talk to. And she says, well, I'm not married. And Jesus says, yes, I know. I understand that. And she perceives that he's greater than Jacob and that she's looking forward to when the Messiah will put everything straight and, and all will be well again. That's the fourth thing he offers her is himself. I find that so amazing. Here he is, the one who called into being all of creation who through the Spirit whispered to the prophets, who came as a child incarnate God and is willing to sit beside people just like me and offer me himself. Do you realize that when Jesus is in control of your life. When Jesus is in control of more than just your heart, but of your mind and of your mouth and of your eyes and ears and of your hands and your feet. When Jesus is in control of everything that you are and all that you have, you have more than you thought was ever possible. And what does the woman do? I'll give you a hint for next week. She drops her bucket. She doesn't need the water that badly from the well. She's just received something that is going to keep her for eternal life. And she runs back to Sychar and she says, is this not the Messiah? But we'll get to that next week. So what does Jesus offer? 
He offers us the drink with the promise that we will never thirst again, that we have spring of water, living water, not juiced up water, but real water, eternal water springing up within us, welling up with an eternal life. And he does it by offering himself. Now do you see why the death and resurrection of Jesus is so important? Because without that, this would never have happened. And without him dying and rising from the dead, it would never happen to us. It would never happen to us. Let's pray. Thank you.